what's that footnote in your Bible doing there? Have you guys read, whenever at, you're reading through your Bible, some of you guys, just showing you for quick, in your Bibles, yeah, some of you guys have footnotes on them that says, manuscript may say, or some of the earliest manuscripts do not have the phrase or word, such and such, or this one says of instead of in. It's all those kind of things are like, what does that even mean? I mean, it's kind of scary sometimes when you start looking at all the different ones, and you're like, well, how do we know which one to use? Okay. Or, I know I've heard before, uh, about a month ago, someone came up to me uh, after church, and they had said, you know, we've been hearing this thing about Matthew 21, 13, I think was the reference. And I was like, I have not. And they said, well, it's been all over the place, like, preachers are talking about it, and the news has been talking about it, and I'm taking that verse out. And I'm like, well, I haven't heard of that specific situation yet about that verse. But, due to what I have been aware of other places, it would be called textual criticism. We're getting our three off to bed. You ready? So, in this series, we've been talking about maybe answering those questions that you have had. Again, what's that footnote doing here? What, what's that going to mean? Or maybe the people that you're discipling are going to be asking you. Because they're going to be looking at the same verse saying, wait, but this says it wasn't in the earliest manuscript. What does that mean? So, in this series, we were talking about what is God's word. And is the Bible is the... The Bible is a library, collection of God's inspired writings throughout history that he had written and inspired many, many uh, the prophets and the apostles and all those things. And then we talked about, hey, if we have all these different letters going around to the early church, how do I know which ones were true or which ones were being made up or just not accurate? How were they figuring out which ones to go to? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes. 100% it has to be the Holy Spirit. And then they were also using the eyewitness accounts and saying, what were the apostles' teachings? What were true? I mean, again, if I was writing a letter to, I don't know, Edderville, and I knew that that was my letter, but then another letter they received saying, this one's also from Daryl. And I'm like, I never sent that. That would be good to know. So we, they needed to know which letters were truly from the people that said it was writing from. So we have now the canon. And then today... Looking at how these writings are even passed to you and me today. I mean, 2,000 years is a long time. How easy is it for you to lose one of your papers at home and you're like, where did that go? Right? And we know some of those things don't even last. I mean, I looked at a receipt that was just from a year ago, and I'm like, there is nothing left on this receipt. The ink has faded. I'm just under the paper. That's amazing that we even have things from 2,000 years ago. Anyways, we'll get there today. I'm excited about that. But then next we're talking about the different translations and why they are important. So, looking at God's Word distributed. I don't even get this Bible. Just plop into our hands. Woo! Thank you, God. God just keeps shipping them into the stores today. No, He had, he had a great hand in that, and I'm thankful for that. But how have we received it? Well, for a long time, most people, I mean, here, think about this. 1800s, here in America. How many people could actually read? Not that many. Okay? Let's go back 2,000 years. How many people could actually read? Not that many. Okay, how easy was it to publish a book back then? Yeah. We didn't have the printing press back then, right? Yeah, exactly. All written out hand by hand. That gets expensive. You think about uh, taking your car to the auto dealer shop, right? And have to pay them hourly? Can't imagine having to pay a scribe to copy a letter. So oftentimes, people couldn't even read. And so they had the people that would stand there and say, Hey, this is the letter we received from Apostle Paul. Listen. That's what they could do. <laughs> and so they would go ahead and listen. And they would constantly come back to the to uh, oh my goodness, the temple, yes, but the synagogue. The synagogue and be able to listen to the letters throughout. And they would receive letters back and forth. So, like Paul, he talks about, hey, Colossians, in his letter, Colossians, says, you Christians in Colossae, after you get done reading this letter that I've given you, please pass this on to Laodicea. Now, Laodicea also has received a letter already, and I need you guys to pass it, and I want you guys to read it also in Colossae. So please, make sure you guys are reading these letters. They're important in being able to have them together. And oftentimes, once I received a letter from Paul, 
we would have somebody write it down. So in our location, we have that letter, and then we pass that original off to Laodicea. Laodicea would be the same. They would, oh my goodness, here's Paul's letter that he's given to us. We're going to go ahead and copy it real quick, and then pass that one on. So that way, people, Christians, would be able to continue to re receive these texts and these letters from different apostles. Okay, so that was a reference for Paul. Uh, then Luke, he talks about all these different uh, uh, writings that were being shared, and he says, look, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things Jesus has accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, and they ministered to us the word delivered to them. It seemed good to me also, uh, having followed closely from some point now, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Again, there, there are a couple of things that people are saying, well, did you hear that time that Jesus did this? And they're like, I've, I've been with Jesus this entire time. He never did that. Right? And so Luke is saying, hey, there, there's a couple of things going around. And like go, going with eyewitnesses, like a detective, finding out what the truth, what that, what really took place. He was an investigator. Saying, I've collected these times for a while now. I want you to know exactly what happened while Jesus was here. Okay. So yes, it was first shared verbally time and time again. And these letters would be passed between those who could read and then copy. Um, and so we're, there's a couple verses there that they would receive the Holy Spirit. So they could be witnesses among the areas. And then from this time, we were just sharing what we had heard from Jesus Christ himself or what we saw with our own eyes or even touched with our own hands, Jesus himself. We were there concerning the word of life. So that's what we're sharing with you so that you may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son of Jesus Christ. For we can't speak on something that we haven't seen or heard. We're, we're sharing exactly what has happened. And then this time in Acts 11, Peter began to explain to them in order. And you can read the rest of Acts 11 and see that. Just one of those oral accounts that he had given. The author of Hebrews said, uh, there, why would we escape if we ignore so great salvation? Like, we cannot ignore what has been revealed through Jesus Christ or the salvation we have received from him. No. See, this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So, culturally, they couldn't read. A lot of them couldn't read. It was, it was a lot by reading aloud these letters. Writing was expensive. Watch this. This is awesome. The materials were expensive. Egypt had these leaves. Okay, these leaves were like abundant. And they would take these leaves and one would, they lay it this way and then they lay the other leaf this way. They'd press it together, have it dry, and voila! This is one that we have been able to discover. And this one was specifically P46, early 200s. Guys, that is within about 130 years after the original. These papyrus were so well preserved because they lived in such a dry location. <laughs> no moisture. And so they were able to be preserved for almost. 2,000 years. That's beautiful. I get so excited about that. But, they would also stretch out animal skin, and this would become a lot of their parchment, and after it had dried and was stretched out, then, here's another one. It's kind of hard to see, but you see all those speckles there? The animal skin, basically leather, thin, thin, thin leather, leather that they were riding on? Well, I, I, I probably guess leather is going to last quite a while, right? But we've been able to discover this, and let's see, so that one's from Codex Sinaiticus, we'll talk about that later, but those things are expensive to ride on. You did not want to mess up. You basically, it was like that time of like, this is what I've received, and I've got another, kind of like that birthday card you received from the store, or that you just bought from the store, and you're on your way to the birthday, so you're riding in the car, I did this yesterday, you're riding in the car, and I did a typo. I messed up. And then I had to scratch it out because i that's all I could do. I had no other option. I already spent my money and I already was on my way and I couldn't go back. This is expensive. You don't want to mess up on this. So you had a professional writer, a scribe, 
go ahead and write for you. Make the copies and oh my goodness, that process. We're not going into that today. But over time, we've had a lot of different scribes at a lot of different places making careful copies of these letters. But what happens when a scribe makes an unintentional mistake? A letter misplaced it. A typo. And now his copy is shared to be copied by the next location nearby. And then that same one goes ahead and makes the same exact copy of that same mistake. Now we've got a couple floating around this mistake. What do we do with that? For us, we have a footnote, but we're getting there, okay? So you end up with a variation. The rest of the letters all said this, and this specific letters over here, these copies, had that little typo there. Text of criticism. So we have those footnotes in the Bible. What do they mean? Why are they there? Human scribes copied these letters. Human, right? Human error. We try our best to make sure that there's no error. And yet, no matter how hard we try, to just think of one little dash being in a slightly wrong spot or didn't quite connect to the next person saying, I think that one's a D. It looks like it. Uh, some of you teachers, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's such, it's one of those things where it's like, oh my goodness, what do you do in those times? I mean, even in science, you have a 5% margin of error that you're like, okay, as long as you can get into that 5% margin of error or target shooting, right? Do you always shoot perfectly right on target every single time on that exact same dot? No, no, no. You're wanting it as closely collected as possible. 5% margin of error. It's everywhere. Why? Who's the one shooting? Who's the one writing? Human. So, we keep that in account. I mean, just reread an email or a text you just sent to. And you're like, whoop. I'm for sure I typed that out right, and it's not anymore. I didn't catch that typo when I was writing it. Or maybe as you're copying notes. Curiosity. When you make notes, or you're copying notes down, I've seen some of you guys take notes up, that's up here. I know there was times in my life when I was a student in high school that for some reason I copied letter by letter. I don't know if it was some of the words I didn't even know how to spell, probably. And so I looked at every single letter and was I trying to write it out. Well, at some point, I might end up spelling cats as C-T-A-S instead of C-A-T-S because I was so focused on each letter that I wasn't looking at how did I spell the word, right? But what about word by word? Maybe when you're doing that, maybe you accidentally put one word over here instead. And you switched the order just a hair. Maybe you picked up at the wrong spot, you know, whenever you were writing that paragraph of the notes. And uh, you looked up, you were finishing up that sentence, and then you looked back down, you kept writing, and then you realized, I'm not ending at the same spot I was. Oh, I skipped an entire line there. In those two sentences, the same word existed, and I actually skipped this entire section. Whoops. I was so focused on the word, that I didn't realize that I had missed the rest of the sentence. Word by word. What about phrase by phrase? I know exactly what it's saying. So you go ahead and write out the phrase that you just said five words at a time or whatever. How accurate is that sometimes? I mean, how about this? When you're at a conference or a convention and you heard that one liner that you just love. Oh, it was so good. You had to write that real fast. Of course, they didn't have it on a slide or anything, so you just wrote it down. And then just to make sure you got it right, you looked over to your neighbor. They were either using a different slightly word than I was using, same meaning, but a different word, or a slightly different order than I just wrote down, and we just heard it three seconds ago. So when you're, even when you're writing phrase by phrase, you think you know what you are writing down and what you heard, uh, sometimes you get a little too arrogant, and it's like, uh-oh, I didn't get it down exactly as it was said. So that's just how we are. Humans copying, taking notes. So human error is real, and most of the time, unintentional. Like, I thought, I've seen 70%, 80%, 80% of these footnotes in here are unintentional mistakes. <coughs> just one of those that we were just talking about. 
How about this? Talking about just a typo. Uh, in fact, this happened this morning. Somebody sent me a text and I said, you know what, I chose a different word last night for this example, but that one will work better. He had said, uh, Happy Father's Day, uh, and, and basically I'll, I'll change it in a different way, but if I had written a text saying, Sammy and I just got back from a walk, <laughs> you as a receiver would be like, that doesn't make sense. Pretty sure that's a typo. What happened there? Autocorrect. Autocorrect, exactly. But even for that, two letters switched. But what word should be there? Well, you guys are great. Textual critics right there. You guys have looked at it and said, ah, no. Even with English grammar, we know that that should be from. It was a mistake that had happened. We were still able to quickly process hey, that letter and switch it. So, this would be very similar to textual criticism. Trying to determine what the original said. Even with a typo, it can definitely still be done if you guys just did with these. Now, I gotta say, sometimes a whole lot easier like that is simple to say. But there's other times it's not that easy. But this isn't just for the Bible. This is for any historical document that we don't even have cut the original up. Great. We still have we the people, right? You can see that in handwritten, that's amazing that we have that. You can see it. But if you're talking about Plato, Aristotle, Homer, the Iliad, all of those, we none of them are, we don't have an original of those. Everybody has to do textual criticism to determine what the original said based upon what we have. So, there are copies going around with these differences and variations. We're going back to that question. What do you do about these? How do you work to find what is original? Let's get into some more of textual criticism. There's many variations in the Bible. In fact, one atheist biblical scholar, you heard me right, one atheist biblical scholar has a lot of works out there, books and stuff, and he shared, again, it helps make people, it doesn't help necessarily, but a lot of people then second guess the Bible. And I uh, can't think of the name right now, but anyways. He says about there are more variations according to his calculation. There's more variations in the New Testament than there are even words in the New Testament. I mean, in some ways it's true. But people are like, then I can't trust it. Ah, but see, that's the issue is going to what we were talking about with textual criticism. No, I have full trust in what we have. There's more variations. Why? Well, when I was purchasing a car, I would go to car complaints. On car complaints, they share, people share, every single time they have a complaint of their car breaking down, they can share on there what took place. Well, I always love looking at my Mazdas. I wanted my Mazda so bad, and guess what? There is hardly any complaints on there. I mean, there is hardly any. But then you go over to the Chevy Malibu. Woo, wee! They got like thousands and thousands and thousands of complaints on there. My Mazda was looking real nice without hardly any complaints. Think about this realistically real quick. How many Mazdas of that same model are actually out there? <laughs> okay. And how many owners are out there with that Mazda? Not that many, right? How many people have a Chevy Malibu? Way too many. Those things are everywhere, okay? How many complaints do you come in? A lot. Does it mean that there's actually that many issues with that car? Or is it just because sheer number of vehicles out there. There could be thousands of people with a Malibu complaint. But it could still only be maybe 2% of the population. And there could be a hundred complaints on this Mazda. But it could still be 30% of the people. Just due to sheer number. So, of course there's so many variations when it comes to scripture. When we have so many manuscripts that we have discovered, especially compared to Plato, Homer, Tacticus, we're getting there. Okay, the more vehicles are out there, the more complaints do to share number. Same with these manuscripts. Same, the larger the number of variations, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, there are a large number of variations, but that's expected with a large number of copies made by human hands. 
Plus, when I say these variations never hinder theological issues, the doctrine stays the same. Whether it be there or not, honestly, God's word covered it in other places. Fantastic. Amazing. I love that. So, again, if those differences might be a slight spelling here. Uh, plus, there are no dictionaries with the standard there. That's interesting. Most people just knew the word was kind of spelled that way, but again, making those things are kind of expensive. Uh, maybe a slight different word order or synonymous word, etc. So each misspell or misplaced letter counts as a variation. Form, from, one variation. Already messed up. And then the next person writes first, it said. Don't know why, but or front. Don't know why, but they wrote front. So there's another variation. Okay. So what do we do with that? All the variations? There's criticism. Uh, Case for Christ. Some of you guys have watched that movie. Lee Sherwell uh, read the book. He got a little E.B. short miniature book, answer booklet. And in there he has said, thankfully, the more copies we have, the easier it is to determine what the original said. Because the forget the book, like, if the majority of these are all saying from the walk, and these five over here said, form the law. Which one is it supposed to be? From the law. The more, the more manuscripts we have, the easier it is to determine what the original actually said. Because there's more to compare between them in order to weed out mistakes. Real quick, another one, how to read Bible for all it's worth, Gordon P. Uh, he has said, there are two kinds of evidence that translators consider in making textual choices. The external evidence, the character and quality of those manuscripts, those that are being passed around, and then the internal evidence, like the kinds of mistakes to which copies were susceptible, the grammar, the, the writing, the copying itself. Okay, you guys ready to dive real fast? We're diving. Get ready. External criteria. Favor the older manuscripts. Right? Ready? Manuscript or copy from 1200 AD says form a law. And we have a copy from 300 AD that says from a law. Which one are we going with? The earlier one. That would make sense. Which one was first? Now, for the past several decades, the oldest thing that we had was an entire book of, sorry, centuries. Past couple centuries, they were using, our oldest manuscripts was about 1000 AD. That's still a thousand year span between Jesus and our manuscripts that we have for the longest time. That's what people translated from. King James, all of, like that, they were basing upon this Mesoratic text that we have. Ah, that's just a game of telephone. You don't know if that's actually accurate between the past thousand years until 1946 when the Dusty were discovered. That was amazing. So once those were discovered, from 200 B.C. to 70 A.D. writings of the Old Testament and others, and they were able to compare between what we had 1,000 A.D. and basically zero, they were almost exactly the same. Praise God. It's so wonderful to know that it was still faithfully passed down, even in this span that was missing for so long. Okay. So, they had that. Uh, quickly, the oldest one that they found is P52. It's, it holds part of the Gospel of John. This was written about 120 to 130 AD. About 50 years after the original. Maybe you're not excited about it. I am. I just love it. I, I just get so excited that we even have such a thing like that. Codex and Atticus, some of the earliest books. Earliest copy that we have of the entire Bible we have today. 300 AD. I have a lot of trust in the Bible you and I are holding today that it's still the closest we have to the original. When we can look at that and compare notes and say, yep, they're basically very much the same. That's amazing. 
Again, there's those variations in it. That's what the science of textual criticism is all about. That it suggests the Bible we have is reliable and accurate translation of the original that we have. Okay. Let's quickly go through this. If not, uh, I had this in a newsletter back in March of last year, and I can share some of it. Again, we'll probably put it on Facebook. That'd be great if we can just post this one on Facebook. Um, but again, let's go with just Homer. Okay? If you go through, there's only 33 known copies of that. Plato, 210. The Iliad that we have, that we read in high school, right? And we have full trust that that was part of the original text that Homer wrote himself. There's only 1,700 of those copies that we have today. And the earliest is 400 years after. What about this? 23,000 manuscripts. It blows all the rest of them out of the water. If you would quickly stack up all of the other historical documents that we have of manuscripts, it would be about a pile four feet tall. Okay. That's not too bad. That's the loss of manuscripts we have. When it comes to the Bible, you would stack all the manuscripts we have. It would be a mile high. Wow. We've got a lot of manuscripts. And if we can trust these other guys and determine <coughs> that we have basically the original text, I have full trust in the New Testament of Right? Right? That's amazing, well-recorded, preserved. So, you can have that confidence. Uh, figure the reading of the majority of the other texts. We said that by here. Uh, the majority of the U.S. has one copy that says from a walk. And silly me as a copyist in Jefferson City wrote form a walk. And the people in Jeff City now all have a copy form a walk. If the rest of the U.S. has from a walk, and Little Jeff City has from a walk, uh, probably a copyist error in Jeff City, aka it was probably me. And we can say, okay, we know that there was a there was a mistake there, but the majority of them are all saying this, and we know it's from a walk. We already kind of went over that. Um, uh, also, again, also favoring the ones according to geographical locations. Think about a university. On your uh, on your uh, resume, oftentimes you write down which university you graduated from. Why? <laughs> Good school credentials. Uh, 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 oh my goodness, I lost the word again. But yeah, credentials. I mean, uh, uh, higher standards. Yeah, credentials. Okay, so that's the word I'm looking for. But. You know that, like, hey, uh, Oxford, Harvard, we, we throw out all those names, and it's like, when you hear that, you're like, oh, yeah. And then you hear this, I don't know, some college that we have, community college here, and you're like, okay, who's doing the better practices? Sometimes. Sometimes. But what I'm getting at is when you, archaeology or anything, like, they're looking at the ones with the highest standards, the highest credentials, knowing they're going to be faithful to what they need to be doing. Okay, there was that big university in Alexandria, and they were copying well. And when they know that they have a group of texts that came from Alexandria, they're going to rely on those a lot more than some of the other ones, than some other maybe smaller, rural place of writing. That we didn't even have a university there. I don't know. But, okay, that's external. Internal, let's go through this quick. Favor the reading that fits the literary context. You guys have done that. Form from. Which one fits the context? Around the wall. So, also, writing style. You can tell when somebody else started writing versus when I was writing a text. That's why I feel so bad whenever Sam says, hey, could you finish up the text for me and say such and such and such. She doesn't give me the exact thing, but she's like, just let them know we're on our way. And I'm like, okay, we're on our way. But I don't text the same way Sam does. I didn't use the same punctuation. I didn't use whatever. And they're like, this isn't a text for Sam. It says Sam, but it's not Sam. And so even there, it's like, it didn't fit the grammar and style of writing for that person. So you can kind of look at those variants and say, this one is the author's, this one doesn't seem to be from the author. Uh, favor, 
Does it flow? If the variance there doesn't flow, or does that like doesn't it doesn't make sense? Again, uh, I can't quite give an example. Oh, there we go. Derek, my brother, has really enjoyed working at the golf course. At the golf course, he works hard on making the greens look good. Yesterday, Sammy enjoyed her greens with some chicken. Now, after work, Derek has time to finish up mowing other people's grass as well. Okay, so there's a variance in there. I don't know what happened there, but it didn't flow, right? So some manuscripts have those that variance about Sammy eating greens, maybe those that were in Jeff City, and the earlier ones didn't. We're going with the one that did it. Yeah. Something happened. We don't know what happened. In fact, uh, we could, but we'll get there. Uh, Finger the reading that corresponds best with writings by the same author. So Paul. How does Paul typically write? And then we get this other letter, and it's like, it kind of says Paul, or it's, that kinda, it's one of his letters, but that variant, again, doesn't quite fit the rest of the way Paul writes. It doesn't seem like it's Paul reading. It doesn't quite fit. It's a variant. So that is kind of helpful in those situations, but yet, I mean, N.T. Wright also pointed out, hey, I write scholarly books. So where I, some of those books, I am challenged. I can't, I'm having trouble reading the books. And then he's like, but I can also write to a lay person. He's like, so just to say, it's not always my right time, doesn't, but anyways. Uh, so favor, the next one, favor the reading that best explains the origin of the variance. Let's explain. If the textual critic, can actually determine a logical reason why such an error occurred. Uh, as I had said earlier, you're copying notes and you're going word by word, word by word, by word by word. And you stopped at this one word, used the restroom, came back, okay, where was I at? Oh, from, got it. And then you start writing. Oops, I just missed an entire sentence or paragraph. Okay, that happens. Or maybe you doubled up a word or something. That's why, anyways. So there's, there's those things and that's nice to say, all of these manuscripts from this location missed this sentence. Is it potential that he actually did that? He missed that sentence due to these two bookend words. So there's an explanation there. Um, let's skip that one. Favorite the shorter reading. The, I, this is so interesting. Uh, later scribes add a note. You guys noticed that on the animal skin. One, did you notice that something was off to the side? And the margin? Okay, so if we look at the uh, next picture, uh, later scribes would then say, uh, hey, we've always known that this letter was from Ephesus. Or not from, but to Ephesus. This was a letter to Ephesus, and we've known that. But we're getting to the point where some people don't know that. It's now 300 years later. That's not common knowledge anymore. And so he, in the margin, not of the text, but in the margin, wrote in Ephesus. And now the next scribe writes it in the margin in Ephesus. The next scribe writes it in the margin in Ephesus. And at some point, somebody didn't put it in the margin, and and it now got into our Bible saying in episode, Ephesus. That's why in your Ephesians letter, there will be a footnote saying some of the earliest manuscripts do not say in Ephesus. But I love that that is there. That we have a picture of literally what took place. That's what it's in Atticus. Okay. So, even when those happen, you will potentially want to have the shorter reading. Because the scribe was adding a commentary note to the text, and now it became longer, and some of the other variants were shorter. And it's like, okay, it seems like without it. But that's an example. Favor the more difficult reading. Paul is confusing. Even Peter said that that one time. He's like, I, you know Paul's confusing. Right? And there's times I'm confusing, right? <laughs> yeah. And so if you were explaining to somebody else something I just said, you might simplify it in a way that makes more sense. Right? And sometimes when they were reading Paul's stuff, they're like, the, Paul, I don't know. What is this word? I think the compound word that you created and made up, it seems like this is the word that people would actually understand. And so they would change to have the same meaning, same meaning, just a different word. Well, now we have a variant again. And so you want to rely on the more difficult readings, 
Because over time, you're going to simplify it to make it more sense instead of what the original person said. That's it. Guys, you did it. I know I just was starting to lose some of you. You guys did it. Textual criticism. I need you guys to know that because that way when people are asking why is this verse being taken out, no, it's going back to the original. Right? We want the original copy and we want what the original authors wrote. And if that verse didn't come up into a thousand AD, it's not original. We're wanting the original. So we're going back to the original. As you're discipling people, as you guys are going through the New Testament together, and you're looking at these notes down here, I need you guys to be able to process through these things and be like, yeah, I, this could maybe be what happened here. There's also, this is of the Greek. And down here, this half tells you the variant and tells you which manuscript said which. Special criticism. It is fine, so that way you can sit here and say, based upon this, yourself, what it should be. So there's those things. But guys, you get it. That was the deeper look of what's that footnote doing in my Bible? What does it mean? Can I still rely on the text that we have? Yes. Definitely. So, uh, summarize it. The study of the manuscript evidence for a written work of which the original is no longer extant, with the intent to discern the original text. That's that sexual criticism, looking at the manuscript we have to determine the original text. Involves gathering and organizing data, evaluating variant readings, reconstructing the history of the transmission of the text, which we did this morning, and attempting to identify the original text. So, I hope this helps you as you are reading. I hope this helps the people you're discipling as they are reading with you. I hope that this gives you some clarity on why some manuscripts may say one thing while another says another thing. And that it doesn't need to be an alarming concern, especially when it's potentially just a typo. Variations do not need to be too concerning, especially when there are so many manuscripts to lean on while we work through what the original may have said. So it gives me great trust in what we have. It gives great trust, hopefully, to you, to the people that you're discipling, and, and to me, that what we are reading today comes from faithful men and women who have passed this text on, doing hard, tedious work. My hand gives out so quickly just writing the letter. I mean, hard, tedious work with the Holy Spirit and God's Word. That's why, thankfully, even Hebrews 4, 12, again, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing the soul and spirit of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart that is still alive and active today, still being able to do that due to, thankfully, faithfulness passing that uh, text and script and letter down through the generations. It's still to come. Recommended resources. If you enjoyed this, we we dove a little bit deeper than just the surface. But that's not even close to everything. The NET translation Bible gives you all those textual notes while you read, saying why they chose the translation they did. Why did they put of instead of in there? You can read along with it. So the NET translation Bible has it. Uh, textual commentaries, uh, they say why we chose what we did here. Um, and study Bibles. Some of your study Bibles go into depth, saying, hey, again, manuscripts here, and it will show up, share a lot of things we went through today. You did it. I really hope that helps. And again, I hope that gives you even more trust in what we have, even when somebody says there's more variants in the Bible. Or in our text today, in words in the New Testament. And you can say, yes, but. <laughs>